by our Rafael Del Pino and Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs uh, of Spain fellow, um, Alvaro uh, Renato, and his uh, research assistants, Constanza uh, Suniga, and I will get to introducing them in just a moment. I just want to uh, thank you again for being on this call at such a great number. I am seeing here that we have fellows from our project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship with us. We have Alvaro's predecessor, uh, Ambassador Fidel Sendargota with us, and I want to say a particular welcome to him. I want to recognize the senior leadership uh, of the Spanish Foreign Ministry. I know we have colleagues from the United Nations from the Spanish Foreign Ministry with us uh, this afternoon. And of course, I want to give a special uh, salute to the many students who are on this call, both from the Harvard Kennedy School, but also uh, from Complutense students uh, who were once in a classroom when we weren't operating in a virtual form um, with then Professor uh, Renato. So I want to give a special welcome to all of you. Um, most of us are joining you from Cambridge, Massachusetts here on the moderating side. I want to thank Erica Menuselis, our project coordinator, for putting this together. And without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, the two presenters for this afternoon and give you a little bit of the ground rules of how we will manage our discussion. So, of course, our main presenter is Alvaro Renato, who will be, um, well, a known entity to many of you. He was the director of the Department of European Affairs and the G20 uh, for the presidency of the government of Spain uh, of uh, the G20 in 2016 to 2016 to 2018. He has a very senior uh, career in the Spanish Foreign Ministry. He was the sous Sherpa for the G20 and the European Union in that time. He was responsible for the stewardship of European policy within the cabinet office of the Spanish government. Um, and his career, of course, goes back to 2006 when he started uh, his diplomatic appointment. But he also is a now senior academic, uh, we can say. From 2014 to 2016, he was associate professor at Complutense University of Madrid. Again, many of his students are on the line today. He was a senior lecturer there um, on the legal and political system of the European Union. And he has continued that work uh, with us. And this, again, is the second of uh, a series of seminars that are focused, that is focused and dedicated on looking at the health of the US and EU uh, relationship, the transatlantic relationship, um, looking specifically at the impact that Summitry has had on this relationship um, post the innovations in foreign policy of the Lisbon Treaty. So because this is the second part um, of a seminar, Alvaro and uh, Constanza will take us through sort of where we left off and the questions we look to probe over this hour and 10 minutes. Um, but before we get into the meat of it, I want to introduce Constanza, who is one of our Master's in Public Policy students. She is also a Wrangell Fellow at the U.S. Department of State. Um, she was, uh, she'll be entering the Foreign Service when she graduates. Um, last summer, uh, she was a Foreign Policy Fellow in the office of the late uh, U.S. Congressman Elijah Cummings, and she has been very engaged not only on this research project, but through her time um, in academia on questions of transatlantic relations, the European relationship with Russia, and of course, the relationship that the United States has toward its European allies in NATO. So first of all, welcome to Alvaro and Constanza. Thank you for doing this. Um, the ground rules is that, or are that um, Alvaro will present. We have a slide deck um, and there will be certain moments uh, where Alvaro will pause and entertain questions um, so that we can have an active discussion, even though this is somewhat of a presentation format. I know many of you will have urgent questions of the day at the forefront of your mind. This is a very difficult time for the transatlantic relationship and for the world. Um, we would ask that you wait to entertain some of those questions later on and that we really focus on thinking through uh, some of the questions that this new paper that will become a fully fledged paper, it's currently still a work in progress um, that Alvaro and Constanza are putting together so that we really focus on the substance of this paper. So without further ado, Alvaro Constanza, over to you. Kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Good morning to everyone in the US and good afternoon in Europe. Thank you very much for your attendance. 
It is a true pleasure to see all of you today and give you a sneak preview of the findings of our most recent research project on transatlantic dialogue. Before such findings are published, as Catherine said at the outset, we had a great first seminar a few, a few weeks ago in which we presented some of our quantitative data findings on EU-US political dialogue since the Clinton administration. Today is a continuation of such seminar. We will focus on our qualitative research findings in light of the interviews we've conducted with high government officials from the Trump, Obama, W. Bush, and Clinton administrations, as, as well as relevant literature and documents in my own diplomatic experience in the field. I would like this seminar to be held in a dynamic format. What I will do, as Catherine explained, is briefly present a general overview of the research project recall some of the data findings we presented in the first seminar, and then delve into the qualitative findings. I will ask for your views and open it up for discussion. We have a distinguished audience today from all over the world, and we look forward to benef benefiting from your insights. Since August 2019, with the invaluable support and guidance of professors Nicholas Burns, Joseph Nye, Carl Kaiser, Catherine Kluver, Julian Howarth, Sebastian Royo, Sergio Fabrini. We've been working on a research project here at Harvard Kennedy School, which addresses the following questions. What impact have EU foreign policy instruments had altogether on transatlantic dialogue? Why have these instruments been ineffective and what could be done to make them more effective? An important note is that EU foreign policy instruments were significantly extended a decade ago by the Lisbon Treaty, which entered into force on December 1st, 2009, a little over 10 years ago. With the purpose of boosting the EU's performance as an international actor and reinforcing its interlocution with strategic partners on the global scene, the treaty introduced the following institutional innovations, a permanent president of the European Council, a revamped High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, a full-fledged European External Action Service, and the Union's own legal personality from the perspective of public international law. Data and qualitative analysis show that these instruments, since their deployment, have not avoided a deterioration in transatlantic political dialogue, ongoing since the Clinton administration. And what is more, such deterioration accelerated 10 years ago, right after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. This can be considered somewhat of a paradox. Dialogue between the US and the EU has been less fluid during the post-Lisbon period, when the EU has had significantly more foreign policy instruments and legal capabilities of international maneuver. Has this acceleration in the decline in transatlantic dialogue been in spite of or because of the Lisbon Treaty? Why has the Lisbon Treaty been ineffective for strengthening US-EU political relations and avoiding ever-increasing transatlantic rifts throughout the different crises of the past decade, most recently and notably COVID-19? These are the questions we will address today. One important point I would like to highlight is that obviously the Lisbon instruments are not the main reason for the decline in US-EU political dialogue. As we explained in our first seminar, powerful underlying structural and exogenous factors have contributed to post-Cold War disengagement between the US and the EU. The end of the Cold War and the cohesive glue that had bound together the EU's and the US's strategic interests the war in Iraq, tensions over climate policy, the pivot to Asia, the impact on the transatlantic bond of the crises from the 2010s, economic and financial, immigration and refugees, the Trump administration, COVID-19. Most of these factors have been profusely studied and it is commonly acknowledged that we are at the nadir in transatlantic relations as a consequence of the conflux of these factors. However, Without prejudice to these exogenous factors, 
In our research, we focus on the endogenous factors decided internally by the EU that have restricted the effectiveness for dialogue with the US administration of EU foreign policy instruments. These factors, which we will present in detail today, are three. One, the political profiles of incumbents of Lisbon Treaty institutions. Two, structure of US-EU summits. And three, EU institutional and bureaucratic complexity. Before deep diving into them, please allow me first to give a really quick glance at the data we presented in the first seminar. As shown in figure 1.1, can we see figure 1.1? There we go. US-EU summits at presidential level had been ongoing annually since 1995. It was precisely after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty at the end of 2009 that US-EU summits became irregular and came to an indefinite halt. Figure 1.1a shows that while US-EU summits have declined since 2010, sectoral summits between the US and the EU at lower levels of government, secretaries, ministers, and officials proliferated since 2007. However, irregularity in these sectoral meetings indicates that there's no conclusive evidence for the consideration of these meetings as equivalent substitutes for political dialogue through US-EU summits. Figure 2.1a shows the visits by the US presidents and secretaries of state to Brussels. This data indicates that the secretaries of state travel more to Brussels than the presidents, as is expected given their roles. This may convey a sense of continuity, but things change if we present an aggregate picture. Figure 2.1b shows the visits to Brussels per administration and shows that there has been a decline in overall visits to Brussels, the heart of European institutions. And this decline indicates a waning presence of US administrations, not only at the, EU, at the EU's headquarters, but also of NATO's headquarters. In theory, the opposite phenomena should have occurred. The Lisbon Treaty should have led to an increase of US presence in Brussels, due to the post-Lisbon summit system, in which summits are supposed to take place always in Brussels. Before Lisbon, they took place in national capitals and in, or in Washington. Instead, the opposite phenomenon occurred. Figure 2.1c shows that all the presidents have been to Brussels twice, and the difference in the total by the administration lies in the visits by the secretaries of state, as indicated in figure 2.1d. As I explained in our last seminar, we've also quantified visits by US presidents and secretaries of state to member states of the EU, which remain more or less stable. This, however, is not the focus of our study, which seeks to analyze political dialogue between the US and the EU as such, its institutions, not its individual member states. Lastly, further data also challenges the assumption that the decline in transatlantic dialogue is a purely Trump phenomenon. Figure 2.1e reflects the visits to Brussels as percentage of total visits abroad by the president of the US. And here we have the striking finding that Donald Trump leads the ranking. Figure 2.1f reflects visits to Brussels as percentage of visits abroad by the Secretary of State. And once again, we have the striking conclusion that Michael R. Pompeo leads the ranking. Figure 2.1G reflects visits to Brussels as a percentage of visits abroad by administration. And once again, the Trump administration leads the ranking. Now, obviously, it goes without saying that this information must be considered in the context that President Trump and his administration have the least total travel abroad and have opened up a new chapter in history 
that scholarship and policy analysts have rightly considered as a nadir in transatlantic dialogue. Osansa, would you like to add anything else before we move on to the qualitative analysis? Yeah, so I just want to add that this data was compiled using the U.S. State Department's historical records of all of the visits by presidents and secretaries of state. So this data does not reflect visits that were not officially recorded. Okay, okay, that's, that's a crucial element. Um, before we pass on to the qualitative analysis, uh, Catherine, anyone else want to make a brief comment? Uh, just a question on methodology, Constanza and Alvaro. Um, when you looked at visits, where you you obviously classify between visits and meetings with EU leaders versus um, meetings with NATO leaders and the, yes. the type of leaders, correct? Um, Constanza, on to you if you want. Yeah, so um, with each of the visits, there's a description um, about who they met with and what the content was. So uh, interesting, a lot of the Brussels visits were joint. Um, Pre-Lisbon, a lot of them were US-EU summits. And then post-Lisbon, we saw that a lot of the Brussels visits were uh, visits specifically geared towards NATO. And so um, we can capture more of that nuance in the paper. Yeah, um, I mean, there is a tendency to try to kill um, several birds with the same stone. So when the president goes to Brussels, um, he usually meets um, with NATO um, he attends a NATO summit and also holds meetings with EU institutions. Right. Then one quick question on methodology from Mary uh, Aitema and from Seth Johnston, just to see how you guys are ranking. Trump is still in his first term. That might be a, he might be a only first term president. We don't know. Others had second terms. How are you ranking those numbers in the context of length of U.S. presidency? Well, that's that's an obvious factor, and it's, uh, it's specified in the number of visits to Brussels. I mean, we're just taking into consideration the percentage. I mean, this is obviously a very striking, it's almost a provocation. Costanza huh? had a reservation. She wasn't sure if we had to introduce it. But I thought it was an eloquent figure that a significant chunk or percentage of the most anti-European administration in, rec in, the, in recent history mm, has been to Brussels. Costanza, hmm. would you like to add anything? Yeah, and I think that I want to add on a methodological note, I did consider the fact that other presidents had served eight years and kind of looked trend-wise if, you know, the Trump administration did, on average, usually the number of visits per chunk of four years doesn't substantially change that much. So if the Trump administration remained on their own trend, would they, their percentage be higher? And the answer is yes, because in the first four years, their percentage is already higher, higher than the other presidents in their eight years. Right, we have one more question on methodology because you did obviously look at uh, secretaries of state visits to Brussels. To what degree did other senior officials uh, make it into your ranking and did you decide to include or not to include? Judith is just pointing out that vice presidents, for instance, do not make it into this particular data. What was your choice there and why to decide to not include other senior officials uh, of the U.S. administration in their visits? Well, yes. um, yeah, here, um, we focus on the president and the secretaries of state. Um, we left the rest, for example, vice presidents for the qualitative analysis. And that's a really important element of the qualitative analysis. Okay? in which we'll delve into shortly. Costanza, would you like to add anything? Yeah, and there were also some data limitations with the Office of the Historian records from the US State Department. So per legislation and per law, they're not required to report visits by the vice president, but they are required to report the secretary and the president. So that was part of the reason why those got left out because we wanted to rely on official records. That way we weren't missing meetings. Okay, I think that's very helpful. That's what we have on the chat so far. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay, so um, in light of these data findings, let's move on to the next part of the research project, the qualitative analysis. Beyond the aforementioned structural exogenous factors of transatlantic disengagement, what are the endogenous factors that have restricted the effectiveness of EU foreign policy instruments? By endogenous factors, we mean circumstances which have been decided internally by the EU within the margin of discretion afforded by the EU treaties, 
and in which affect the functioning, configuration, and contours of the Lisbon Treaty institutions. In light of the interviews, literature, and my own experience, three main endogenous factors have surfaced, as stated in the outset. We will start with the first one, the profiles of the holders of EU institutions. I will explain each factor individually, and after each one, we'll open it up for comments, questions, and critiques. Starting with the low political profiles, it has been thoroughly commented how, since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, relatively low profile political figures, far from being rock stars, have been appointed as the incumbents of the newly created positions, namely the President of the European Council and the High Representative. Since the Lisbon Treaty, the Presidents of the European Council have been as follows. Herman Van Rompuy, former Prime Minister of Belgium, Donald Tusk, former Prime Minister of Poland, and Charles Michel, former Prime Minister of Belgium. Of these leaders, Donald Tusk is, to date, the highest political profile in this genus of post-Lisbon presidents of the European Council. The post-Lisbon high representatives have been Catherine Ashton, formerly and briefly EU commissioner and an unknown parliamentarian from the UK, Federica Mogherini, formerly and even more briefly, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, and Josep Borrell, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain, President of the European Parliament, and Deputy Prime Minister. Today, Josep Borrell is the highest political profile in this genus of post-Lisbon high representatives. These figures belong to the exclusive clubs of former heads of state or government, or of former ministers or European commissioners. However, their prior international prominence, arguably with the exceptions of Tusk and Borrell, cannot be compared without, with that of other potential appointees who were, as prominent commentators rightly put it, in the aftermath of the first Lisbon appointments, serious players on the international stage, well-known and highly, highly respected foreign policy heavyweights. These are the words of Professor Julian Howarth one of the most authoritative figures in the field. A salient example of this, long of, of this phenomenon is a long presumed and never officialized candidature of Tony Blair, former prime minister of the UK, for president of the European Council. Blair's candidature never prospered because he was perceived as too Atlanticist, too prone to political grandstanding and too unpredictable. Van Rompuy finally got the job. I, I had the chance to witness firsthand such resistance to Blair in 2009 during backstage negotiations, which led to Van Rompuy's appointment. When we asked a high-ranking European Commission official, who was a very influential figure at the time in the appointment process, about Blair's chances to obtain the critical mass of votes of member states required to be elected president of the European Council, the answer was, Tony Blair, he would definitely run the show, but would he do the job? This caustic remark shows that EU member states and institutions have avoided appointing, as president of the European Council, a high profile figure that could commonly be associated to the idea of a full fledged president. Instead, they have supported more the idea of a chairman or even of a glorified secretary that convenes meetings and prepares consensus in light of the relevant mandates given by the heads of state or government of the member states. While this may seem logical and coherent from the perspective of the internal functions of the president of the European Council laid out in the Treaty of the European Union, Article 15, some of which can be deemed of secretarial nature, it poses problems for the function of external representation of the EU that such treaty also confers to the president of the European Council. Owing to the phenomenon of ever-growing diplomacy made within the European Council among EU heads of state or government, and there is important literature on this issue, this external function should, in theory, be increasingly relevant. However, it can be strongly argued, in light of the data, interviews, and common sense, that this function of external representation has suffered a detriment 
as a result of low profile appointments and other factors, such as job overload. A somewhat similar dynamic can be identified in the appointment process of the first post-Lisbon high representative. Potential appointees included, among others, the then serving German foreign minister and today German president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, Jap de Hoop Schaeffer, former, former secretary general of NATO, and Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland. However, it was Lady Catherine Ashton, a relatively unknown figure both in the UK and abroad, who was finally appointed at the end of 2009. The appointment in 2014 of her successor, Federica Mogherini, bears a certain resemblance. The other two main candidates to the post were Poland's Radoslaw Sikorski, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Bulgaria's Kristalina Gergieva, then a high-profile European Commissioner, today Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. By and large, facts indicate and interviewees confirmed that there is a clear contrast between the capacity of interlocution of these post-Lisbon high representatives and Javier Solana, the pre-Lisbon high representative. Interviews confirmed that Solana had a direct line not only to the Department of State, but also to the White House. He was literally my friend Javier. In spite of the fact that his successors had frequent interlocution with the National Security Advisor and were considered, rightly so, effective interlocutors, both with the Department of State and the National Security Council, they have not matched High Representative Solana in this ability. Attributed to Solana's unique track record, to his special pedigree, but also to his personal deafness. In 2009, months before the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, Javier Solana deployed joint diplomatic actions and travel to the Balkans together with the US Vice President, Joe Biden, a transatlantic feat which has not been replicated to date. This goes to you, Judith Merkius. He also carried out joint initiatives and trips with the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. All of this in spite of the fact that Javier Solana, as pre-Lisbon High Representative, had incomparably fewer means and powers in comparison to his post and successors. He was not vice president of the commission. He had no European external action service to support him. He barely had a budget. Literature has considered that some of these post Lisbon appointments underscore the EU's tendency to allow political horse trading to triumph over merit. Be that as it may, the appointments make evident that among European member states and institutions, there is not great appetite for high profile figures and may prove to be difficult to control. This phenomenon is perhaps attributable to what has been considered a failure to translate the ambition of political rhetoric into administrative practice. Without judging the opportunists of such appointments or the performance of their respective incumbents, a counterfactual analysis would, per, would could perhaps be useful to identify possible correlations between the profiles of some appointees and the effectiveness of the instruments for transatlantic dialogue. For example, would Tony Blair have been a more effective interlocutor for U.S. president than Herman Van Rompuy? Would Jap the Hoop Sheffer, former NATO Secretary General, or Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, have been more successful interlocutors vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. State Department than Catherine Ashton? It seems highly likely that they would have, although, of course, one can never be sure. In any case, interviewees coincided on their diagnosis of the cause and the effect of this phenomenon for transatlantic dialogue. Most consider the unwillingness, especially but not only among large member states, to appoint strong, high-profile political figures as heads of EU institutions, as quasi-structural and part of the EU system. And I would tend to agree. Certain interviews underline that clearly too much compromise lies beneath the appointments of the heads of EU institutions. And the result has been 
low profile figures, which are not as credible as political heavyweights in the eyes of a US president. Such thinking resonates with Henry Kissinger's reflection on the impact of bureaucratic structures on foreign policy. According to Dr. Kissinger, decision-making can grow so complex that the process of producing a bureaucratic consensus may overshadow the purpose of the effort. A less sophisticated way of portraying such risk, and I was commenting this the other day with Professor Fabrini, is what scholarship has designated as the consensus trap. One prominent interviewee referred to a dialectical tension between one, this internal reluctance amongst member states to appoint high profile figures, and two, the external benefits that such high profile figures would afford in terms of international representativeness. This dialectical tension is very difficult to solve, except perhaps concerning issues on which there's a common European interest. The thing is that such issues of purely common interest may be today somewhat of an entelechy. Even in challenges in which a common approach would afford absolute gains for member states, and Seth, this, is, this reference is especially directed to you, like fight against terrorism, climate change, COVID-19, there are constant skirmishes among member states and fissures in their respective positions that bog down and dilute the common approach. The interviewees agreed unanimously that the political profiles of the heads of the EU institutions undoubtedly make a difference in diplomatic interlocution between the EU and the US. When asked whether the appointment of a high profile president of the European Council, like a Chancellor Merkel or a President Macron, would be seen by the US administration as a more respective interlocutor, the interviews gave all of them unequivocal positive answers. One official expressed skepticism on the practical utility for foreign policy purposes, and I think this is fascinating from a political point of view, of the institutional innovation of a permanent president of the European Council. This high government official from the State Department told me, we always thought that job wouldn't work because of member states' historical disinclination to pool sovereignty within intergovernmental institutions. However, the official admitted that should a high profile figure be appointed, things could be different. A common element most interviews highlighted as essential for transatlantic dialogue and which may be associated to the political profile of an institution holder is the ability to create strategic unity in the various parts of the European enterprise. For the US, an institution or actor is seen as a better or worse investment depending on the capacity to bring together a common European position. For example, Several former members of the National Security Council confirmed that during the Ukraine crisis in 2014, President Obama's key European interlocutor for the management of such crisis was Angela Merkel. No surprise. The main reason, apart from her fluid interlocution with Putin, was that she could deliver the EU and guarantee that every member state would support sanctions against Russia. Similarly, High Representative Solana's special track record enabled him to bring together a unified European position in an efficient way. Interviews stressed that when crises arose and the US required the EU's intervention, Solana had the ability to effectively tell the US what the EU could bring to the fight, be it military support, economic aid, sanctions, etc. Solana was able to run around the EU and do all of this. He was a one-stop shop, in the words of one interview, for the US. Catherine Ashton could also bring together a common position on certain issues, like Kosovo and Iran. She too could be a one-stop shop, but at a lower level. For example, in the JCPOA deal with Iran, she successfully represented medium and small member states of the EU which were designated by some of the interviewees from the State Department in uh, humoristic diplomatic jargon as uh, minnows or small fry. In sum, acknowledging that the tendency to appoint 
low profile political figures reflects the structural nature and limitations of EU polity and may be quite difficult to surpass in the short and medium term, it seems clear that this tendency has curtailed the effectiveness of the Lisbon institutions on transatlantic dialogue. And from a broader perspective, it seems equally clear that such tendency entails costs in terms of the EU's capacity of international interlocution and representativeness and the integration of its foreign policy. These research findings call attention to the strategic convenience of fostering initiatives that raise awareness on this issue within European institutions. In a similar way to how the so-called Copenhagen criteria laid out the general standards EU candidate countries must fulfill, Article 49 of the treaty, the appointment of the leaders of EU foreign policy institutions should also be carried out according to certain basic criteria. In the relevant EU decision-making processes, namely in the European Council and the European Parliament, serious consideration should be given to criteria of diplomatic expertise, political gravitas, and attested capacity of international interlocution of the candidates to lead EU foreign policy institutions. This would be fully compatible with quota logics, the balancing of appointments considering geographic origin, gender, and political affiliation, which characterizes EU institutional appointment processes. The quota logic is not an obstacle for frank assessments on the strategic profiles of candidates according to such criteria. Costanza, would you like to make any additional comments? Yeah, so I think kind of to sum, a lot of the criteria for selection has been focused on these internal functions of the roles rather than the external functions of the role. And I saw in the chat that someone mentioned, would that mean that would exclude someone representing a small member state? And the answer to that is no. It would just be more about focusing on a balance between internal and external capacity. Yeah, um, totally agree. Um, Costanza is a future US diplomat. She's a State Department here, here at Harvard Kennedy School. A future ambassador, I have no doubt. And what, she's, what she indicated is precisely right. It's the balance that must be struck between the capacity of international representativeness and the capacity to manage internally negotiations within the European Council. And both of these capacities are linked by one condition which is an assen essential. A condition which was defined in Roman law as autoritas, as publicly, publicly acknowledged wisdom. This, unfortunately, is not always the case in the appointments. Would anyone else like to make a contribution bef before we pass to the second factor? I just want to ask a quick question because you spend so much time on Javier Solana's function in your qualitative analysis. I mean, of course, it's of critical importance that Javier Solana, in terms of the authority vis a vis the United States, had been NATO Secretary General. Um, and, you know, and so to pick up on Judith's point, the flip would be would that possibly necessitate, or, or do, you, do you go in and reflect on qualities and capacities of external authority? Um, on the international stage in terms of the kind of candidates that were floated. So you mentioned Yap de Hope Skeffer. So in your analysis, do you reflect on why, again, certain candidates made a short list, didn't make a short list, and for what reasons? Because I think that would add yeah. to answering some of the questions that are coming yeah. up in the chat. Yeah, well, thank you very much. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, we, we dedicate um, significant and uh, thorough attention and focus to this issue. Um, we have today with us uh, Professor Julian Howarth. Um, his uh, oeuvre, his book on uh, European Common Security and Defense Policy uh, refers to this issue. And also there's an amazing article published by, by Professor Howarth um, called the New Faces of Lisbon, in which he thoroughly refers to the flukes, the reasons, and the political accidents that um, contributed to the um, appointments of these figures. Um, perhaps in the Q&A, uh, we can dedicate more attention to this. But basically, in the case of Ashton, for example, um, 
it was linked to the presidency of the European Council because um, from the very beginning there had been a consensus that the, pres the presidency of the European Council had, had to go to the UK. But when there was a critical mass of opposition towards the figure of Tony Blair, then the consensus shifted and moved towards a high representative. And it was acknowledged that the UK had had this post. And it was David Miliband initially who was the figure. But David Bill Miliband, owing to reasons of domestic UK policy, was not available. So mm, it was a very pressing issue. And uh, it was the, president, the then president of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Bra Barroso, um, who suggested um, that his colleague, then commissioner for trade, um, Lady Catherine Ashton, be promoted to high representative. And um, this is how it turned out. Um, obviously, uh, she was not the most versed diplomat. She did a good job. I mean, this is very debatable. I know that many people present would have different opinions, but um, she started the role. And uh, she received harsh criticism, but she had to um, face unprecedented challenges, which was basically um, the starting up, um, the revving up of this new engine of the Exter European External Action Service. But perhaps we can go in further detail uh, at the end on these flukes, and perhaps Professor Holworth could, could comment later on. So um, can we pass on to the structure of the US-EU summits? Uh, Catherine? Okay, so in the pre-Lisbon period, US-EU summits included as participants all of the heads of state or government of the European member states, along with the president of the European Commission, and since its creation in 1999, the high representative. Summits took place in EU member states and Washington. There were, however, significant differences with the post-Lisbon context. There was, a, there was a fewer, albeit growing number of member states at the time, 15 in 1995, 27 today, which made relatively more manageable summits with has a state of government. And also, a different formal framework was in place. Summits were organized and chaired by the member state which held the rotating presidency of the council that semester. While this enabled high-level representation of the EU when such presidency was exercised by large member states, it was a double-edged sword, and the reverse logic kicked in when small member states held the presidency. It is important to highlight the general political context in which the post-Cold War system of US-EU summits was established in the early 90s. According to certain interviewees, European statesmanship lived its glory days in the 80s and well into the first half of the 90s. During that period, members of US political elite associated European leadership to high profile figures. These included Commission President Jacques Delors, French President François Mitterrand, who held the rotating presidency, by the way, of the European Council twice, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, who held the presidency of the European Council on three occasions. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who held the presidency of the European Council twice. And Spanish Prime Minister Felipe González, who also held the presidency of the European Council twice. Notably, these leaders coincided in time and space, and they raised the power profile of EU leadership and institutions. Of course, strong leadership in the eyes of the U.S. was not by any means a constant feature of the pre-Lisbon period. Jacques Santerre's presidency of the European Commission from 1995 to 1999 was perceived as weak and erratic by interviewees who were in office at the time. And small countries, of course, such as Luxembourg or Belgium, also held rotating presidencies of the European Council. But in the glory days, Charismatic European interlocutors, both in the European Commission and in the European Council, were not uncommon. And this is not irrelevant in a context in which the participants of EU-US summits were fundamentally the members of those two institutions. After the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty at the end of 2009, 
the functioning of the summit system changed significantly. In the post-Lisbon context, summits take place in Brussels between the U.S. president and the heads of state of EU heads of state. Excuse me, between the U.S. president and the heads of EU institution, no member states present. And this is the key element: no heads of government or of state of the member states participate in the summit. As substantiated in the data section, U.S.-EU summits became more irregular in the post-Lisbon period. In 2010, shortly after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, the U.S.-EU summit, which had been scheduled for May, was canceled at the initiative of the U.S. administration. The reasons why such summit was canceled are not mysterious. As one interview related, President Obama was not a fan of U.S.-EU summits. The uncertainty ensuing from Lisbon has also been invoked as a cause of the cancellation. Lisbon was becoming confusing. The US administration canceled the summit partially on the grounds that it remained unclear in Washington who really represented the EU. The 2010 summit was reconvened in November that year and the media spoke openly of Obama's, of Obama's TD. And small wonder, because the president confessed openly to the press that the summit was not as exciting as other summits. The next and last US-EU summit took place in Brussels on March 26, 2014. Subsequent meetings between the US presidents and the presence of EU institutions and or heads of state of government have taken place on a bilateral basis or on the occasion of other international summits. President Obama's malaise during this last summit became well known in the European diplomatic establishment and has been confirmed by several interviewees who were in contact with the president at the time. One of the interviewees referred to the summit literally as awful and reported that the president after the summit expressly asked this person, don't do this to me again, ever. Now I've been chief mm, diplomatic advisor for Europe in the office of the Spanish Prime Minister. And I can assure you this is not what you want to hear from the big boss. And this negative impression was reflected in the majority of opinions of interviews. Interviews underlined President Obama's unenthusiastic attendance. And one interviewee even stated that President Obama felt he had to kiss the EU ring, but deep down he didn't want to go. Another interviewee similarly admitted that the president was reluctant to attend the summit, but ended up going because of the value he placed in the EU. We're focusing a lot on the 2014 summit because this is the last summit. After this summit, an unprecedented breakdown took place in a summit system which had been ongoing since 1995. Most interviewees confirmed that one of the main reasons of such lack of enthusiasm in the 2014 summit on the US side is that the participating figures on behalf of the EU were perceived as relatively unfamiliar by the US president. The European participants in the summits were the president of the European Council, Van Rompuy, the president of the commission, Durao Barroso, and the high representative, Ashton. According to one interviewee, particularly close to the, at the time to the president, these participants led to the usual bafflement of the US president when he was put in a room with all of these people, representing different institutions, the rationality of which is not always self-evident in the US. Just last week, I held an interview with a very distinguished former government official who literally told me, we were never a fan of meetings only between the US president and the presidents of EU institutions. We thought that they were a waste of time and held them owing to pure courtesy. Ouch. Moreover, one could legitimately ask if President Obama's bafflement was due mainly to the institutional setup of the summit and the poly presidency system. Professor Holworth has asked how many presidents does it take to run the EU? Or if this bafflement had something to do with the low political profiles of the participating heads of EU institutions. According to one of the interviews from the State Department, when Van Rompuy was appointed, I had never before seen his face. 
Two other issues regarding this summit, which were identified by the majority of interviews as problematic for the U.S., were the long duration of the summit and its perceived lack of political deliverables. With regard to the former, most interviewees regretted that the summit went on for 90 minutes and was ultimately too time consuming. Another in interviewee lamented the European tendency to speak too much and too long. And I have a feeling that today I may be incurring such tendency. I apologize and I'll open it up really briefly for discussion. Regarding the perceived lack of political deliverables, the majority of interviewees underline that a U.S. president tends to favor events in which specific high-level actionable items can be agreed upon and easily sold to the U.S. press. In this line of reasoning, a prominent, a prominent former member of U.S. government has indicated that in general, U.S.-EU summit agendas have been too formulaic and process oriented when they should be more substance and action oriented. Another interview considered regretfully that the 2014 summit had no substantial agenda. The U.S. frustration with the agenda of the summit was explained by another interviewee pointing towards two questions that hover in the U.S. political mindset when deciding whether the president should participate in certain diplomatic engagements. What's really the point of all this, this person told me, and what are we going to get out of this? For the majority of interviewees, it remains clear that the 2014 summit did not sufficiently address these concerns. Such considerations certainly contrast with the joint statement of the summit, a powerful and detailed declaration of common objectives and values, difficult to imagine in the current political scenario. It also contrasts with the internal reports on the exchanges held within the summit, according to which important specific issues were addressed in the fields of economy, trade, energy, climate, data protection, and foreign policy, not least, by the way, U.S.-EU coordination within the Ukrainian crisis. Our research findings indicate that adequately calibrating the substance of the summits and attaching political deliverables to the agenda is of the essence. Issues of scope and overreach must also be taken into consideration. Certain interviews, for example, suggested limiting summit agendas to the issues on which the EU has exclusive powers, such as trade or competition, and not forcing foreign policy issues at the level of heads of state or government, but deferring them to a ministerial level, high representative or secretary of state. And by the way, I would like to stress that most interviewees underline the crucial role of the high representative as a counterpart of the Secretary of State. Another interviewee considered the focus of the summit should be on one, geographic areas in which the EU can really deliver added value, such as its neighborhood, southern or eastern, and two, strategic policy fields for transatlantic cooperation such as trade, data, digital sanction, military, law enforcement, humanitarian aid, climate change. Most interviews also consider that a change in format is necessary and that it is naive for the EU to dissociate the heads of state or government from the summit system. Their main argument was that having immediate executive powers and bases of perceived electoral legitimacy, the heads of state or government are conceptually closer than presence of EU institutions to the US president's idea of a political leader. The interviewees were consulted on the feasibility of alternative hybrid, more operational formats that could include as participants, both the presidents of EU institutions and the heads of state or government. Most of them considered that if the choreography were carefully calibrated to avoid long series of, of interventions, such hybrid formats could be an option. For example, and this is a possibility I spoke about with uh, when I was uh, in the office of the prime minister with my colleagues in the G20 on the U.S. side, the U.S. Sherpas, a possibility is to hold a hypothetical European Council meeting in transatlantic format. This format would enable the U.S. president to participate in what is considered the pinnacle of power in the EU. On the European side, 
both presidents of the key European institutions, European Council and European Commission, and the heads of state or government would be present because the European Parliament does not participate formally in European Council meetings, only right before. To keep the meeting agile, European interventions could be limited to the two participating, to the two participating presidents of EU institutions and the member state who holds the rotating presidency of the Council, who would intervene on behalf of the rest of the member states. On the US side, the US president could attend the meeting with whoever he saw fit, be it members of his government and or external figures, such as the Secretary General of NATO, who in recent years has participated in European Council meetings. And of course, in the margins of such European Council, bilateral meetings or inside events could take place. Interviews, by the way, stress that it is in these bilateral meetings held in the margins of plenary sessions where the really interesting things happen. In sum, a European Council held in transatlantic format, or for the sake of brevity, transatlantic council, could enable the US president to kiss the EU ring, meet bilaterally with the presidents of mm, EU institutions, and also with the heads of state or government of his choice, and thus kill several birds with one stone. Of course, such hybrid formats are but one possibility of the kaleidoscope of options afforded by the ample boundaries of EU law. And needless to say, being legally feasible does not make something politically opportune. And different circumstances of political nature would need to be adequately gauged. And one important thing is that such transatlantic European Council would not assuage at all the too many people at the table critique, because in my experience, for example, in the G20 summits, a U.S. president can end up feeling ganged up on if so many, if there are too many people at the table. This, for example, happened in the 20, 2017 um, Hamburg summit in, in Germany. Several interviewees from different administrations emphasized that meetings with all of the EU member states are very off-putting for a U.S. president and should be broken into smaller groups. So this is another possibility. Mm -hmm to organize European participation in summits in groups of rotating countries, structured according to different criteria, political and economic weight, geographic area, existing mechanisms of coordination, for example, in the Nordic countries, uh, among the Visegrad countries, among the Southern EU countries, population, geographic affinities, etc. So, Gostanz, we'd like to add something before we open it up for discussion. Yeah, I think I would just want to add, um, there's been some questions about the importance of summits and why we want to keep them and why they should stay. And I think the answer to that question is, diplomatically, there are certain issues that have to rise to the highest levels of government that can't be resol resolved in sectoral meetings, can't be resolved in lower level meetings, and require the final decision making of the highest order. And so summits are an opportunity to get some of those really high level issues resolved. And we've seen as a result of summits, some of the most contentious issues get resolution because of meetings of the highest levels of government. Yeah, um, I totally agree. And I would give two specific examples for that. Um, in the European Council, in one of the most acute moments of the economic and financial crisis in 2012, when the ministers and the ECOFIN Council were dragging their feet and were unable to agree um, on the single supervisory mechanism, which was essential to um, convey a message of resilience uh, and trust in the Euro, the issue had, was unblocked by the European Council because it was such a sensitive issue and it really corresponded to the biggest bosses, to the heads of state of government. Um, I mean, which acted actually like Weberian leaders uh, who put their finger in, in, in order to move the wheel of history. I mean, the ministers weren't, didn't have the political capacity to adopt those decisions, which were potentially very unpopular in their respective um, domestic constituencies, but were ultimately essential to safeguard the integrity and the stability of the Eurozone. Another example is in, 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 during the Clinton administration, for example, when um, Singapore was keen on negotiating a free trade agreement and at the level of ministers it was completely blocked because Madeleine Albright opposed uh, such, uh, such free trade agreement and it was actually unblocked 
um, at the level of heads of state or government between the prime minister of Singapore and President Clinton um, during a multilateral summit and actually during a golf game between uh, the president and the prime minister. Uh, they brought it up, said, okay, let's do it. And when the president got back to Washington, he was like, okay, I agreed to do this. Uh, obviously, Madeleine Albright was not very happy, but she went along with it. So sometimes it's the political force exerted by a state government is needed to really deliver. Sorry, this is the BBC Korea moment happening behind me. Um, so I think that was an incredibly in-depth look at the various different aspects and levers that you touch on in what is now a, a, a paper that's that's very grand in scope. So what I thought we might do in the 20 minutes that remain. Well, I have, I have, wait, 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 but there's, there is a third factor yet I have to refer to. We, we talked about the profiles, we talked about the EU summits, and right now we have to talk about the third factor, which has restricted the effectiveness according to the interviewees, which is EU institutional and bureaucratic complexity. But perhaps uh, I'm seeing that Professor Royo has, has, uh, has his hand up. Should right, we, exactly. Uh, I thought that we, we can quickly do two, two quick questions on method and then get to your third part and then just open it up to open Q&A. And I just want to okay. encourage everybody who wants to ask a question as part of the open Q&A. We've mentioned uh, Julian a few times, if you want to weigh in here, to signal with the raised hand function so that Erica and I can see um, who wants to speak and we can put them in a ranking. So Sebastian, go okay, ahead so, and yeah. unmute yourself, ask your question because it's on, on structure of the paper. Okay. Thank you, Catherine and Alvaro. Um, congratulations on a wonderful presentation. Constanza um, answered part of my question, which was the reason for focusing just on summits and symmetry. Um, but I want to emphasize, I mean, summits are just one of the dimensions of political relations, and you seem to equate dialogue with summits, and there are other ways in which dialogue can take place, um, not necessarily um, um, just in the form of summits. And also, um, you can have a deterioration of relations based on many other factors, not just on the fact that you have less summits. At the same time, um, the, the causal link that you, I think you're trying to make in, in, in your presentation, in your paper, doesn't seem to be entirely clear to me. On the one hand, uh, you made the case that you have um, less summits and that has in some ways lead to worse relations, um, but it could be the other way around, that you have worse relations because of other factors and that's what leads to less summits. So it's not clear to me what the dependent and dependent variables are. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. And thank you. Right, well, I mean, having worked in the office of the Spanish president of the government, I focused on dialogue, on political dialogue at the maximum political level. And I believe, as Costanza, in the usefulness of summits, because I insist certain dossiers, certain, certain decisions can only be adopted, can be mobilized at the highest political level. And I mean, it's just, I lived the 2012 experience when, I mean, there, were, there was a, a question mark hovering over the integrity and the stability of the Eurozone. And in spite of that, ministers of finance were dragging their feet in the ECOFIN, similarly to what happened in the Eurogroup a few days ago, in spite of the pressing and urgent nature of the issue. And I mean, the European Council stepped in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and unblock the situation because they realized that mm, it was necessary to safeguard the euro and potentially the integrity of the most successful project of political and economic integration in the history of mankind. And it's, so it's, and I, now I would also make the case, and I'm also making the case in, in the case in the paper, that mm, the presence, the physical presence um, also contributes to the development of personal relations. I mean, it's not the same to talk over the phone. For example, when there was a new government in the European Union and this government changed, sometimes I would take a, I would, I would fly over to that European capital and hold an in-person meeting with my counterpart in the office of that president or that prime minister. Because, you know, 
I wanted him to see that I had made the effort. I had caught a plane. I had went over to meet him, to see him. We saw our faces. We had lunch. We had dinner. We shared experiences. We exchanged contacts, cellular phones. And when a crisis arose, I had his direct contact. I would call him. He would answer rapidly. It's, it's different when you've never met. It's different when you've held a video conference or just talked on the phone. So it's actually useful, but it's a very epistemological, I mean, it's, it almost refers to the um, epistemological nature of international relations and diplomacy, but we do make the case in the paper. And then well, I suggest, add on oh, sorry, to sorry, Constanza. I just suggest that you add, we finish your third point, yeah. and then we have already yeah. a list of questions. Um, so just for your preparation, we'll go to Julian, we'll go to Henri Blebump, and we'll go to Carlos right after the two of you wrap up. And I also wanted to add on the point about just looking at summits. So in the paper, in our qual uh, qualitative analysis, we actually analyze each of the administrations, Clinton, W. Bush, uh, Obama and Trump and analyze the whole of the relationship and this wasn't included in the PowerPoint but we also have data points on the economic relationship between the countries which we also think is an important point when discussing the transatlantic relationship so that's included as part of our paper and that kind of holistic approach is taken. Okay okay so the third factor um, which has hindered the effectiveness of the EU foreign policy instruments is a well-known, oft-repeated factor of complexity. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it's, this is epitomized in one of the most famous fake quotes of all time attributed to Kissinger, who do I call if I want to call Europe? But it is fake, but as the Italians would say, se non è vero, ben trovato. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely well-conceived because mm, the complexity of the EU institutional framework remains unresolved after Lisbon. It has been even exacerbated. And one could coincide with Madeleine Albright's nonchalant critique when she said in 1998 that in order to fully understand the European Union to grasp her essence and rationale, one has to be either a genius or French. Now, it's, a, it's an exaggeration, obviously, but there is some truth to it. And a member of the current administration underlined mm, President Trump's frustration with the EU's unfathomable policymaking process. Now, he would give me an example. He's, he would say, President Trump would be mad at the EU, for example, because of the protectionist po agricultural policy. He would tell President Macron, if we don't lower taxes on our products, we'll increase taxes on European cars. And President Macron would reply, well, this issue is Germany's problem. It's not France's. And on top of that, trade and exclusive, is an exclusive power of the European Commission. And then President Trump would speak to President Juncker on this issue. And Juncker would say, sorry, I can't get the French or the German to do this. So this was a constant and exasperating blame game. And another issue of frustration was the divorce between economic policy to a significant degree in the hands of EU institutions, for example, in the fields of trade and, and competition, and national security dash foreign policy in the hands of member states. This generates a conceptual dichotomy between two strategic policy domains, which are closely linked from the perspective of the current administration, because curiously so, members from the Obama administration had doubts on this, on this issue. But for the current administration officials I have interviewed, this, this functional bifurcation led to um, a diplomatic um, interlocution, which was separate because the same US official would deal separately with EU trade people on one hand and with EU foreign policy people on the other hand. And there was one official who's, who referred to this as diplomatic schizophrenia. And the final issue, and I close here, raised by some interviewees is paradoxically the increased powers and administrative structure of the post Lisbon High Representative. Because the post Lisbon High Rep Representative, being Vice President of the European Commission, coordinates and is linked to broad administrative structures, which today extend to 27 commissioners, their corresponding department and services, the European External Action Services. When in Javier Solana, he was completely free and unfettered from administrative uh, structures. So Solana has recognized, by the way, we've interviewed, we've interviewed him. He's recognized publicly that he preferred to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> 
Because if you ask permission, you never do anything. An interview of some interviewees clashes between the US administration and the European Commission on sensitive issues such as trade, taxation, or competition could potentially end up spilling the relations between the post Lisbon High Representative, who is Vice President of the Commission, and the US administration. And we have several examples on this issue. So um, yeah, as, as, as possible, not solutions, but ways to address these complexity issues, we emphasize the importance of communication and of leadership. Because for example, in the COVID-19 crisis, we believe that strong political leadership would compensate to a certain degree the absence of broader legal powers. Um, but unfortunately, this is yet to be demonstrated by the European Union. And I can gladly elaborate on this issue. I think and just, just one, one, one final closing remark before we open it up. I believe that this issue goes well beyond transatlantic dialogue because if the US has issues and has trouble understanding the rationale and the function of the European Union, it can well be presumed that other international great powers such as China or Japan, to put two examples, may well have similar issues. So the EU is facing a credibility test, not only with the US, but with the rest of the world. So that gives us a lot of ground to cover in about two and a half minutes, um, which it, uh, brings our um, seminar to its official close. What I would suggest at this point is that if we can, um, we extend the conversation for another 10 minutes or so. Um, what we have found useful is that if you have additional follow-up questions, particularly to the authors of this paper, you might want to note them in the chat now. These are preserved for eternity, and so if there's uh, an individual exchange that can happen even after we're together, then I'm sure Alvaro and Constanza will be happy to take up questions that way. Um, but I already have a list that's uh, piling up, so I want to um, have the first in-person uh, comment and question come from Julian Howarth. Well, thanks very much, uh, Alvaro, for a fantastic paper. I think this is really, really important issues that you brought up, terrific quantitative and qualitative data. Um, as you know, I mean, I've commented on this paper before at some length, and so I, I want to go over that. Um, I think that the fundamental problem is that the EU is not the US. And to try to compare these power structures, systems, uh, chain of commands and whatnot is extremely complicated. Uh, on the personalities, um, I was a consultant at the British Foreign Office in 1997 after the Amsterdam Treaty where the High Representative was first mooted. And my first meeting down there, I was very enthusiastic. I was along the French lines. Let's have a high profile person. The French were talking about Valérie Giscard d'Estaing. And the Foreign Office reaction was absolutely not. We don't want Giscard d'Estaing and France doesn't want Tony Blair. It's gonna have to be a low level person. And that was the reaction in, in all the foreign ministries. So the question of possibly have being a high level person, I think was just never there. None of the major powers would, would brook it for a second and it's never happened. And, and, and we're left with what we've got. So although your interviewees, I think are very um, eloquent when they say that it would make a difference if it were a high level person, it simply ain't gonna be a high level person. And I think we have to, we have to accept that. I mean, the, the high representative is not the secretary of state. And the powers that are sort of crowded in on him or her don't make his or her life any easier. And that person doesn't refer back to a president, doesn't have sort of, you know, a remit from a presidential power. Um, so the, the, the comparisons are just not there at all. I think um, part of the problem here is that we launched this process of CFSP, Foreign and Security Policy, and the Security and Defense Policy, on a sort of a wish and a prayer in the mid 90s without really knowing where we were going with them or how it was going to work out. And the longer it goes on and the more complicated it gets. And I think your paper has demonstrated that absolutely convincingly that this is ferociously complicated for anybody to understand. And I think you're absolutely right. The Chinese are mystified by it. The Indians are mystified by it. The Brazilians are mystified by it. Nobody quite understands how it's, uh, how it's supposed to work. And I think that uh, 
the result is a growing pessimism about whether it can work. I salute and applaud your continuing optimism that somehow we can get there. And I think these suggestions that you've made in the concluding remarks are terrific and should be worked out. But as somebody who has gone now through three editions of my book on security and defense policy, the first book I was, you know, a cheerleader, tremendously optimistic, proactive, I thought this was going somewhere. Second edition, I had my doubts. I'm now writing the third edition in which I shall make it quite clear that I don't think this is going to happen. Um, so, I, you know, the more you get deeply involved in this, I think there is a sense that um, you either wind up on the optimistic side or the pessimistic side, and that is possibly the difference between us at this point. Yeah. Many, many other things I would, I would uh, you know, I'd love to, to, to talk about. Uh, but as I said in uh, my comments on your first draft, you know, on the, on the summits, if the president, if the US president really finds these boring, and I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. <laughs> Why persist in, you know, trying to make them not boring when they are very likely to be somewhat boring? And the idea of having a council meeting in transatlantic format, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think the president would find that even more boring uh, to attend a, a council meeting. So the answers are not obvious, uh, and I don't want to stress the, uh, the downside of it. I think you've done a fantastic job. It's a great paper, and it will be commented on at great length for some years to come. Well, thank you. Just for those uh, who are not uh, familiar, uh, um, Professor Holworth is non-arguably the most authoritative figure in the world in the field of your common and security defense policy. So it's and uh, very rigorous. So his critiques uh, are very welcome, and um, and I and I'm very appreciative. Just very brief, very a brief response. I share your skepticism. I think it's unlikely for member states in the short run to overcome their national reluctance to appoint high-profile figures. But you know, in the early '80s, distinguished Sovietologists also said that the Berlin Wall was never going to fall. <laughs> And it did. So it's, I mean, I, I don't think it's impossible. I think we, I mean, I think it's possible. It's just, there has to be a, a more than an acknowledgement. There, there has to be um, a pressing um, international necessity uh, when the EU realizes that it's, um, it's, it's in the interest of all the member states to appoint a high profile figure. And I've seen that in the G20 because in the G20, not even the German ch ch chancellor or the French president themselves can arm wrestle uh, the U.S. if it coalesces with China or with Russia. I mean, we need the umbrella of the EU. And if the EU's umbrella is weak and it's not convincing, then it's, I'm not really sure that we're going to be able to effectively defend our interests and uphold our values. And just another issue, I mean, when I was in office, Enrico Letta, in 2014, was one of the candidates to become president of the European Council. And it, was, it wasn't far-fetched, but curiously enough, the then Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, opposed such designation because he was from the same political party and his arch enemy. But Enrico Letta, he would have been definitely a higher political profile than other candidates and appointees. Okay, so. there is so many, so many sub points to those comments, those two alone uh, to discuss. But in the interest of time, we're going to move on. And I'm, I don't know if Henry is still with us, Henri Brebon. He might not be, because um, he had to jump off. But I will just then ask his question, which he put into chat because he would like a live answer from the both of you. Oh, maybe he is still there. Let's see if he is. Um, okay, he is just running off. Um, he wanted to have both of you respond specifically to how you counterweight in the paper the European structures and the interest of nation states and their foreign services and muscling in for airtime um, with the US administration uh, and for their own political interests. Um, so, sorry, I. I lost the I lost the connection and I missed the second part of the 
So all these questions was whether you look it at, in the paper at uh, the counterweight of the national, the member states foreign services. And well, if some of the structural design and the weakness of the structural design as it plays out in practice post Lisbon is actually due to the fact that member states foreign services want to retain their strength and their uh, validity uh, in this yeah. post Lisbon world. Well, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's a, that's an issue of paramount importance we mm, address directly in the paper because, I mean, there's a dialectical tension here mm, between mm, the concern among certain capitals, especially the large member state capitals, um, that their respective national diplomacy may be eclipsed by a high political figure or by a powerful mm, foreign policy structure. And, the mm, awareness of the strategic convenience of appointing a high profile figure and of creating mm, a, a foreign policy apparatus that mm, manages uh, efficiently and powerfully mm, its, its, its activities and its in, uh, functions in the international stage. And um, that's, I mean, we've seen that, we've uh, perceived that reluctance, especially among um, small, uh, among large member state capitals. But there's also a concern, curiously enough, among uh, sm uh, small member state capitals. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, that's an issue which restricts and hinders the adoption of ambitious uh, foreign policy decisions at the level of the European Union. Costanza, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I think the action service and its relationship with foreign services of EU member states is a really interesting dilemma. Um, I think like on the US side at the US Department of State, it becomes, and I think this lends to point three of the institutional complexity, it's hard to figure out who to go to. Do you go to that member state's foreign service? Do you go to the EAS? And I think for uh, on our side, it's just not clear what responsibilities lie with the EAS and what responsibility lies with the foreign services of the member states. And so I definitely think that it, it was well intentioned, but I think it's caused more confusion and more complexity. And I think speaking to Howard's point about on the US side, there's just so much complexity. I remember when I took my first course on the European Union um, and it was taught by an ambassador uh, of Europe. And he said that this is the most complicated thing you're gonna learn. And we always had to be referencing different treaties. And so it gets very complicated. And so I think it's definitely something that we've been considering and yeah. trying to parse out is how can the EEAS and the foreign ministries and member states work together in a way that is going to benefit interlocution between the U.S. and the EU rather than hinder it. Yeah, and for example, um, we uh, put on the table another possible proposal is that um, the appointment of special envoys or ambassadors at large or high representatives for specific crises. For example, in the COVID-19 crisis, who does the U.S. call? The commission? Highly unlikely because the commission does not have exclusive power in the field of public health. Hmm? The European Council? I mean, highly unlikely because of the low profile figure um, and because of the um, harshly criticized role of this institution during the crisis. One of the member states? also an unfeasible um, possibility because member states do not have the legal mandate to coordinate among their peers. But if we had a Barnier or a Solana or someone um, obviously with high level authority who could be associated and who could have the capacity to bring the strategic unity within the European Union to manage the crisis, well, this would clarify to a certain extent um, this high complexity structure. Yeah, I think they're reconciling those multi-level issues, uh, you know, is critically, will need to be part of the ongoing research, but I do think that you have found some very practical um, points within the paper that offers at least uh, some pathways forward. So we have a couple of minutes left. I am very aware of the fact that we have Fernando Begonia, uh, Jose Ra Garcia Hernandez, Javier, still, Javier Gomez Arroyo de la Moro still in line for questions. Um, I want to give- go, Let's go to, yeah, I mean, we have to let Jose Ramon speak because 
he was uh, he's a very distinguished Spanish ambassador and uh, and I would like to hear what he has to say. So what I suggest is we'll have Carlos Carpi go next and then we'll do a quick round of questions and have uh, you, okay. Alvaro and Constanza respond to a number of the issues that those questions raise. So Carlos, you're, Carlos Carpi, you are next. Um, so I would love to also hear what the ambassador has to say. I would like to donate my time. And I sent the writers uh, an email on what I had. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we're going to flip the order a little bit and go to Ambassador Javier Gomez Arroyo de Almoro first. No, it's Jose Ramon Garcia Hernandez. Ah, I'm, see I'm seeing different orders here. Sorry, apologies. I have everything going on the right side of my screen. Hello, and thank you for the impressive presentation that you made. As I've been devoted sometimes to this transatlantic agenda, I would like to put to three very specific questions because in order to reboost the transatlantic link, why don't, instead of the structure, you analyze topics? Because on jihadism, we were perfectly well, both the European Union and the US. On immigration, we were on parallel agendas. On TTP, we were about to believe that we were going to sign an agreement that in the end, it fails in the US Congress, and also because of the presidency of the US. So in order to reboost the transatlantic link, perhaps we should focus on topics, because there is little common ground nowadays. My second question goes with this transatlantic <coughs> link, because nobody in both sides of the Atlantic, and I mean politicians, sees this as an asset. Uh, it's like marriage. You can have discussions in marriage, but you take marriage because we were talking of divorce that I don't like at all in any relationships. <laughs> but mainly in the international field. If you take marriage as a plus, you do whatever you do as an asset to preserve the asset. Whenever you have discussions inside, but very few politicians see the transatlantic link as an asset. And I don't know in, if your papers you see the people you've interviewed, if this sees this as an asset, because then it will become an asset. And I think that the future of the coronavirus, there's a shift in geopolitics, and there is a huge opportunity for the relaunching of a very ambitious transatlantic link. The third thing, you were talking about the profile of the political elite, and that is true in both sides of the Atlantic, not only in the European Union because there is a rapid succession of the political elite. You, you have new players coming out of politics. There are no long careers, as if you were mentioning Barnier, Solana, Gonzalez, Cole, there are no long careers any longer. So there are no replacement. And, this, and then the divorce of the technique of the technicians and politicians is immense. Not to mention when technicians go into politics or the other way around. And we all know that politics is just part and investment in time and in people. Thank you very much, an impressive work to all of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, excellent questions. I fully agree uh, that there's a problem of leadership everywhere. Fully understand that um, substance is of the essence and the structures uh, manage and contribute to dialogue over substance. We've actually published very recently a paper on transatlantic dialogue on climate issues. So I'm also working on that. But this specific research is on how to make the structures work um, a little bit more in a, in a more fluid way. And um, trying to um, make an abstract analysis and obviously focusing on issues on which, which I refer to the end, for example, specific um, regional or substance issues on which dialogue should focus, but focusing more on the endogenous elements uh, that have restricted the effectiveness of the EU foreign policy instruments. But I fully agree with uh, Ambassador Garcia Hernandez. Mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. to add on uh, point two, I think it's really important to draw a distinction between the sentiments and actions of the executive branch of the United States and the legislative branch of the United States. Um, so in our interviews with um, people within the State Department, 
they serve at the leisure of the president and they are an agency within our government. And what we've seen at the US State Department is a lot of our most senior diplomats have left. A lot of people who had a really cared about this issue have gone. But I think the interesting um, argument here is that the, the will in the legislative branch. So I was <coughs> on the Hill last summer, uh, worked for Congressman Elijah Cummings, who was head of the Oversight and Reform Committee. And what I saw on the Hill was that there was a real strong pushback on this idea that the European Union was not an asset to the United States. And I saw that at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I saw that across various committees. And so I think there is a tension, but I don't think it's apt to say that there's a complete disillusionment with this idea of the European Union as a partnership from all sectors and all sections of the US government. I definitely think it's more pronounced on the executive branch side, but I think that there is support on the legislative side. And I've seen it both from Republicans and from Democratic legislatures, both in the House and in the Senate. And we've seen where there have been motions made to have sort of joint um, crossovers between certainly members of the European Parliament and uh, the joint houses of Congress, that that's actually been really helpful in spurring dialogue. And if we think about the powers, uh, if we think about sanctions power, um, the sort of instruments that have been upheld with respect to particularly um, the disruptors in the international system, we think of Russia, there's been actually, of course, a remarkable um, transatlantic unity, frankly, um, between certainly Congress and uh, the European decision makers with respect to upholding sanctions uh, against Russia. Um, okay, so we want to move on very quickly. I have three more um, questions in the queue. Uh, the next one is from Fernando Bugallo. Um, yes. Uh um, thank you, Alvaro, for this fantastic presentation. And I wanted to, to underscore the idea that the whole, the, whole, I, the whole presentation hinges around one, something that I would like to call the structural limits of cynicism. There are two key elements, authoritas and will, that are lacking here. And I have to be brief, so I would like to be also provocative in the sense that I think the lack of will and the lack of authoritas comes from the relation between the Euro, in this case, European politicians and, and so their own people. There is something that is almost a, a, a bad word today that is called propaganda. And propaganda is what the politician does to propagate, to explain, and to try to, to move hearts and minds of their people to do something together. That is tantamount to greatness. And the lack of greatness is what we are talking about here. This <clears throat> propaganda. I mean, the idea of not being able to explain or to propose anything, whereas in, 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 inside a European country, or talking about European institutions, or even NATO, I have discussed this at length with people in NATO, is the key element of the, of the times we are witnessing. And I think with the, your, your referral to, the, to the, the fall of the Berlin Wall is very extremely important, especially if we consider what is happening with the propaganda wars in the case of the Ukraine crisis. There is a power that is playing the propaganda world. And on the other side, there is no sign of vitality at all. So for me, the, 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 the root cause is always the same. It's the lack of greatness, the lack of will, the lack of authorities that translates itself in the lack of proposing anything. Well, that, uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Bugayo. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with what you said. And um, these are important elements uh, in light of which we will uh, continue to fine tune mm, our research paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, next on my list is Begonia Ochoa de Olsa. Good afternoon and good morning. Thank you very much, Alvaro, for your excellent work and for how simply you have explained it despite the complexity of the issue. I wanted to make a more theoretical question related to national so sovereignty. I understand that this reluctance of the member states in the European Union uh, in relation to uh, the high representative of foreign affairs is that they don't want to lose their voice in foreign affairs. So I think this idea is logical according that in the idea that sovereignty still resides in the nation states. So I can't really see how in a short term the situation could change as I think it's quite logical 
that they won't want to lose their power. This on a first, as a first question, how would you see this situation in the near future? And the other question is, the European institutional system responds, as you used to explain to us, to the multi-level governance of John McCormick. There are different levels, national, regional, and supranational. The European Union wants or has a great legitimacy thanks to this complex me mechanism. If you simplify it, you don't have that great legitimacy that it has nowadays on the paper, so to say. So if you simplify the procedure, it wouldn't be so legitimate, so to say. What, um, I think this is a quite interesting paradox. What would you say in the sense if, uh, for example, the Lisbon Treaty would be reformed, to simplify the procedures, probably uh, the functioning or the legitimacy would not be the same. So here is another abstract question that I don't know how, which would be your opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, Veronia Chaleosa is a brilliant Spanish career diplomat and who I've had the pleasure to work with, both academically and professionally. Um, obviously, sovereignty is in the hands of the member states, but the defense of our interests and and values must also be carried out at the European level. And really, I've seen this at the G20. I mean, where, I mean, it's Spain permanent invitee. There's no way we can effectively guarantee the defense of our interests if we do not work within the framework of the European Union. And I have, I mean, ample anecdotes to illustrate this. And we have uh, Gonzalo de Mendoza, who was uh, in the cabinet of uh, the European Commissioner for Climate Change and Energy. And I remember I was in a Sherpa meeting in, the, in like hours before the beginning of the Chinese Hangzhou summit in 2016. And I remember that mm, there was a reference to interconnections in the Leaders Communique summit and France, other European countries weren't so keen on introducing this, this reference. So I called Gonzalo who was in the cabinet of the commissioner he called the cabinet of the president of the European Commission and the instructions were delivered to the Sherpa team and the, inter and the reference was introduced in the communique. We did this, I did this um, through the European channel. So I agree with you, Veronia, but the European uh, dimension is essential. And the complexity of the multi-governance issue is, is an absolute fact. However, I consider in my modest experience that mm, treaty reform is opening Pandora's box. So we would have to try to simplify the existing structures by means of smarter, more effective communication because really opening Pandora's box mm, has consequences which are very difficult to calculate and and it's it's very com a very cumbersome and complex process but who knows eh? that might be the option leaders will um, approve in the years to come I mean there, if there's one thing that is clear is that this paper uh, will have its resonance and leave its mark but that there are so many additional and uh, so many additional areas of research to extrapolate from Constanza's and Alvaro's uh, I think really helpful findings and I think these questions are leading to mm -hmm. the other areas of research which we will have to deepen over time. I have one last question in the queue uh, to round our discussion out and it's from Javier Gomez Arroyo de la Mora. Hello, thanks Constanza and Alvaro for the wonderful presentation and the super interesting research. I do share all your views and I've learned a lot and I can't wait to read your paper. Clearly the lack of a figure as we see has damaged the transatlantic relations. But I wonder if you think that social media and the development of electronic ways of communication play a role in the decrease of the number of summits. Well, nowadays, during the Trump administration, things are really discussed on Twitter uh, by the time the summit is held. And as it has been said by Alvaro, during 2014 summit, there was no content on the agenda. Maybe the summits are starting to be a mere formality. I do believe in the, import in the importance of summits uh, for, and the power of the summits in order to achieve both. Mm -hmm. but does this fact may, may play a role? Good question. 
May social net. I lost the last sentence. May what play a role? The the the, the, the social media and the development oh, social media. Of oh, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. This is um an emerging field of research. For example, um, Harvard professor um, Jim Sabanius, uh, one of the greatest theorists in the world in negotiation, uh, is precisely working on this. And uh, I had a brief interview with him the other day on this issue. Um, of course, it has an impact. And it is, it is an instrument not only of negotiation and the preparation of, of, of dialogue and summits, but also it's an instrument of diplomatic communication. I mean, Every leader abroad uses Twitter for mm, conveying messages of congratulations, for assessing uh, international events, for um, expressing uh, discontent, uh, concern, appreciation for diplomatic and political initiatives. I mean, one of my most difficult endeavors as chief diplomatic advisor of the Spanish prime minister in the field of EU policy was advising on the calibration of the terms of the language used for social media messages. I mean, as a diplomat, um, I am by obligation almost a sem semiotician by training. So, I mean, to calibrate the potential impact on social psychology of the terms used by a head of state or government in social media is an excruciatingly difficult endeavor. Um, but absolutely, you're, you're completely right, Javier. And uh, Javier is a brilliant student uh, and a uh, future Spanish diplomat and uh, very, very well put. Thank you very much for the question. Well, I think it speaks to the quality of the paper and the many issues raised within the paper that we have now officially gone half an hour over our time. Um, and the great interest from this really wide audience. I want to thank Alvaro and Constanza for um, their, their very clear structured presentation. I think the nice um, division in the slides between the quantitative and the qualitative uh, lets people from even afar follow your argument uh, very deliberately, and I think that was exceptionally well done. Um, I know that there are other questions that have arrived over chat. Constanza has already offered uh, her email address, Alvaro's email address, so that this discussion might continue uh, offline. Uh, we're very much looking forward to the final genesis of the paper. I'm working still on my version of this. Alvaro, maybe you want to say two words on uh, where you want to see this research published so that people can engage with it. Um, as it sort of evolves over the next few months. Um, yes. Well, um, by the way, I've, uh, the Belfer Center for Science and International Related Affairs of Harvard Kennedy School has recently published a paper on transatlantic dialogue in the field of climate change. So I can get that to you with great pleasure. It's published on the Belfer Center website. And the findings of this research will have a double output. It will be published as uh, foreseeably as a Belfer paper by Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and also in a peer-reviewed journal. So we're still in the process of crafting these two products, but um, hopefully we will get them to you um, in the near future. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for spending part of your afternoon or part of your early evening if you are in Europe with us for, I think, what was a, a, a really in-depth discussion. Again, thank you Alvaro Constanza for running this so well. Um, I really look forward to having some of the points raised, find input into your paper. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>